Okay, so welcome to the elements lecture. So we are almost there. Uh, yeah, so we are almost there. So we have only two lectures, uh, which will be on SPDC and quantum cryptography, which will be held next week on Tuesday. And uh, it's a matter of discussion that we can follow after the lecture, that uh, the last lecture will be on the elements or it should be on the Friday. So, um, <clears throat> um, so la last lecture, we discussed about the uh, first order correlation function. And uh, we had a feeling about the first order correlation function, what is the meaning of the first order correlation function. And also we drive the expression for, uh, for G1 in three different cases, which they were, uh, we assume that we have atoms, you have uh, collisions, and then due to the collisions, you have change in phase. And consequently, what, you ha what is happening, you lose the coherence. And we, we did a little bit of calculation for uh, that scenario, and also for the case of uh, Doppler broadening and uh, monochromatic waves. So uh, if just briefly reviewing G1 of two, we found that the expression was this, a t and a t plus two divided by n over t, a t. And for three different cases, we did a mathematics and we found, so one was the case of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, coherent uh, light, which was e power of minus i omega zero t, tau. Uh, that was a coherent light, or Poissonian distribution, is what we expected for the case of uh, uh, collusion, we found that e power of minus i omega two minus t divided by two c or two zero, which was the case of collusions broadening. And then we found that g one two is given by e power of minus i omega zero two minus one half of two. T zero, oh, yes, that was true. And delta T, delta power of two, which that was for the Doppler broadening. Why I, I write this? Because you will see today that we need them as well. And uh, if you remember the, uh, the plot that we had for them, uh, we only look at the absolute value. We knew that all of them, they are oscillating with a frequency of omega naught, but we look at the case when we look at the G1 of two absolute value. And we say that for the case of Poissonian distribution, always is one. And for the other cases, uh, for example, Doppler broadening, you have a Gaussian profile. That's a Doppler broadening. And for the case of collision broadening, we had a, a Lorentz function. Sorry, we had a, an exponential uh, decay, which that was the collision. All right. So we had a feeling about uh, the, the first order coherency or, or the correlation function. And then we, we look at the case when you, you look at the intensity correlation and that was a G2 function of two and that was given by A dagger of T, A dagger of T plus two, A dagger, uh, sorry. T plus two and A of T divided by square root of A dagger, A power of two. Okay. 
I think we look at the case of Humbry, Brown and Trees, which by the way, they have a very interesting uh, uh, story to tell you, which I will tell you when, when we look at the, the, uh, the quantum regime of that. And I will, do, some, of, some of you, maybe Josh, can kindly remind me at that time to tell you about the story of Humbry, Brown and Trees. So how they perform the zero research activity. Okay, good, Josh, just remind me at that time. So, and uh, essentially, when we look at the G2 function, we say that it is surprising that you don't look at the field correlation, what is happening between the field. Uh, okay, <laughs> funny. So, uh, <laughs> Some judge is asking that someone has to remind him. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the case of G1 function, what you look, you look at the correlation between the field. So if you have a field, then you look at how the phase is related when the field is delayed. However, in the case of G2 function, that's not the scenario. You look at the correlation between intensity and of course, we know that that can be casted in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of intensity, and this is not more than a normal ordering of intensity at the time of tau and intensity with um, t plus tau, okay, divided by intensity power of tau. Okay, so remember that this this is the normal order. And intensity is usually is given by a dagger a. I mean, d is a photon number, essentially. So and that was a surprising discovery or su surprising observation that uh, you can look at the intensity and still you will get, although the intensity is fluctuating, you can get information about the source uh, or uh, b because there is correlation between those fluctuations between the two intensity. I think I made an example that um, in the case of uh, Humbry, Brown and Trees, what they had, they had two detectors, essentially, let's call them detector, I mean, yeah, detector number one and detector number two. And then uh, what they look at uh, those detectors of intensity one and intensity two, then they look at the autocorrelation between the two. And we say that, look, let's make a delay between the two lengths, or let's say have a, a, um, a time delay here, which is just simple wire, just make a delay between the two detectors, and then a, look for the case when, when the intensity correlation drops down to, to certain value, it gets its minimum value. When it gets to the minimum value, there is a uh, relation between the distance between uh, the, the angular, uh, uh, the angle, uh, the solid angle of the star and uh, the wavelength that you detect and the correlation that you do have it. And I think we explain and we draw uh, the, uh, the explicit expression for that relation. And that was an important discovery and they got the Nobel Prize for this. However, let's look at the G2 function and that redrive all of those derivations that we perform. Now, just pay attention to the G2. So what is the meaning of G2 function? Good. So the first thing that we can do is that uh, uh, we can look at the case, explicit cases, for example, uh, the case of thermal light and find an explicit expression for G, uh, uh, G2 of tau. I would say that instead of looking for correlation, uh, second order correlation function at any given time of T, let's look at, let us look at the value the value at time equal to zero. Because I know that if you delay enough, then the correlation will be going to be zero, okay? For the case of classical light, all right? 
So let's let's look at this case. Uh, by, by the way, I think that is not true. That should be equal to one. So if you look at the the far away from uh, far uh, uh, the the, uh, the look at the correlation between two signals which are completely uncorrelated, then what you will get you will get intensity of t and intensity of t plus two. The, these two they are now completely independent. Then you, what you will get you will get intensity power of two. Okay which divided by intensity power of two will give you the value of one. So for large two, then we expect that should be intensity of T times intensity of T plus two to be completely independent. Then what I expect, I get I and I, then that will be I power of two which results at G2 when 2 goes to be infinity to be equal to I power of 2 divided by I power of 2 that will be equal to 1. Okay, so for two independent, uh, actually independent uh, 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 intensity, do you, you expect that to happen? However, what we are interested right now is at the time equal to zero. And what we want to do, we want to look at the correlation function of G to zero for different scenarios, different light sources. All right. So we look at G2 of zero for different light sources. For example, thermal light, for example, coherent light, for example, we can look for folk state, okay, which you have uh, uh, non classical light. Okay, so let's look at the first scenario. Which one should we go for? Coherent light. So I have to do the calculation of G2 of zero which is a dagger at the time of t, which I don't write it, by the way, a dagger, a, a dagger, uh, sorry, a dagger, uh, a dagger divided by a dagger, a. I don't write the functionality of t. All right? So, This is, this is normal order. So we can go with the distribution that we know. So if it's a normal order, which quasi probability distribution should we go for? P. P, exactly. So we have to go with the P representation. For simplicity, we will go for this. For P representation, what is the probability of alpha for coherent state. Who remembers this? A theta or delta. Exactly. Is a delta of alpha minus alpha zero, which alpha zero, I remember that's a delta uh, um, uh, of two variables. So alpha real, alpha imaginary, alpha zero real, alpha zero imaginary. Good. So Rem, I think we just want to squared on the on the bottom term of that. G2. Yes, thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. So that is the P, which is a quasi probability distribution for this. So what I am expecting from, uh, uh, I'm looking at expectation value of A dagger, A dagger, A, A, or N square normal order. So then that is given by, by D2 alpha, P alpha, and then that is given by alpha power of four divided by integral of D2 alpha, P alpha, alpha square, square. Good. Now I will replace the, uh, the quasi probability distribution for coherent state, which is uh, delta of alpha minus alpha zero 
then as a result, what I will get, I will get alpha zero power of four divided by alpha zero power of two power of two, which is essentially alpha zero power of four divided by alpha zero power of two, which is one. Then for a coherent state, huh, interestingly, the correlation function is one. It seems that they are completely look like independent one. The, look at the case of tau goes to be infinity. They are, look like completely independent. Good. So for the case of coherent state, what I will see, I will see that the G2 function is given by the value of one. All right. Now let's look at the case of thermal light. So it's a normal order, right? Sometimes you may avoid normal ordering. You may, you may cast it in a way that you can simply do the mathematics. But let's look at this. So again, what I have is a G2 function, which is given by zero. No need to write, but let's write it this way. A dagger A power of two. Now I have to do the calculation for the case of thermal light, which I know the quasi-probability distribution, the P representation. That's the reason that I write it, explain it in this way. So alpha power of four divided by integral of D2 alpha P alpha, alpha power of two, power of two. Okay, so what is the P representation? For thermal light. Do you remember? I, we did the mathematics last time. It's Gaussian? It's Gaussian, yes. It's one divided by pi, if I remember. Someone can check uh, minus alpha square divided by n. Yeah. Is that right? OK, so it's p alpha. So replace it here. But I remember that we did the calculation last time when we look at the inten intensity fluctuation. The upper one will be 2n squared, and the lower one will be n squared. Do you want me to do the mathematics, or you can do it at home? Anyone wants me to do the calculation? Just speak up, please. No one? OK, good, glad. So then for the thermal light, f is equal to two. Good. I see some faces. So let me do one of those calculations, just simple one. So if you remember that that what I use as a bipart. So I say that we do have integral of d to alpha, p alpha, Let's say alpha power of two. I'm doing the, uh, the dominator one. So it will be one divided by pi square root of n integral of d to alpha e power of minus alpha power of two divided by n. And then we have alpha power of two. And I say it here. So d to alpha go to the complex plane. So you will get d theta d, uh, sorry. Uh, alpha d alpha d theta, then that will give you one divided by pi n, and then you will get two pi from integration over the d theta, and then you will get alpha uh, power of uh, d alpha, then e power of minus alpha power of two divided by n, alpha power of two. And then I say that choose alpha square equal to u, then that integral will be um, d, d one divided by n integral of du e power of minus u divided by n and u yeah. So then we say that that's simple, you can do the mathematics. 
you will get, if the power is m, we will get gamma of m plus one, which m is integer, then the gamma of m plus one is essentially m factorial. Then what you will get, essentially, you will get uh, an uh, power of two divided by n. So then, okay. So in a similar way, you can do the calculation and you will get the coefficient of two from the gamma function. Good, so for the thermal light, we know the result as well. Now, let's do the calculation for the case of Fox state of N. Good, anyone wants to give me a hint? I want to calculate the G2 function of zero, which is A dagger, A dagger, a, A divided by A dagger A power of two. So anyone? No thought? Do I know the P for folk state? Nope. No, I don't know. So simply that is trace of A dagger A, A, or the density matrix. And this is the Fox state. So the density matrix essentially is given by N, N. Right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a pure state divided by a dagger a power of two, which is again, that is the trace of this power of two. So Josh, can you tell me what is the explicit, what is the expression for uh, dominator, let's say. So what I want to do the calculation is a dagger a average, right? Which is trace of a dagger a on the density matrix. Right, and the density matrix is just a uh, pure state of n n. Well, then you gotta you have to uh, you have to sum over the diagonals of like, yeah. so, sum remember, over. Remember, the row is only one state of n is a pure state. So for example, n oh. is two, right? Right. Can I write it in this way? Is n a dagger a n. Because that's the only term that I will get. Remember that this row is n, n. Then you can expand it in any basis that you want. And the only remaining term will be this term. What is the value of this? If you have any hint on this? It's just n. Exactly, this is n. So I get n squared. Can you follow the same strategy and tell me what is the uh, nominator, which is the trace of a dagger, a dagger, a, a, and, and. The same strategy, essentially I will get n, a dagger, a dagger, a, a, n. Let's cast it in a normal order and let's see what we will get it. And let's get it in the, in the form that we know very well. So it's a dagger. Now that will be a, a dagger minus one, a, putting on n, then I will get n. That term will be a dagger, a, a dagger, a, acting on n minus a dagger, Oops. 
and a delegate a acting on the So this is nothing more than a delegate a power of two acting on n minus n. Uh, and also this is nothing more than n operator. So can you tell me what is the result of this? So the first term will be n squared, right? Because n operator acting on n will be the value of n. The second n operator will act on this and again will give us n squared. And the other term will be n. So essentially I will get n squared minus n. This is not the only way that you can do that. You can use the annihilation creation operator. So a, a dagger on n, you can do the calculation. You can see what is the value. So a on n will give us square root of n, acting in square root of n and lowering the, uh, the ket state to n minus one. And again, apply the other one and you will get the same value. So then for uh, folk state, what we'll get, we will get one minus one divided by n square. Oh, sorry. N. So let's summarize. So <clears throat> for thermal state, G2 is at the at the time of zero is equal to two. For coherent state, G2 is equal to one. For folk state, G2 at the time of zero is equal to one minus one divided by n. This is Poissonian distribution. This is super Poisson and that is sub Poisson distribution. Okay. I remember that uh, we discussed that about in terms of delta i power of two. So we discuss about them in that concept. We will briefly touch these also uh, maybe, maybe today. Is it clear? So is now look like G1, which G1 goes to be one and then either you will get a decay and in that case, you will see that the case of thermal light, you will get two. So um, in the classical regime, in the classical regime or in for classical light or for classical probability distribution, for classical field, it is not difficult to show that G2 of two is related to G1. By this relation. So make the square modulus of G1 plus one, then you will get the G2 function. Clear? So what do you expect for uh, for collusion broadening? We minus two. True. What about Doppler broadening? Remember, those are all classical fields. We did the mathematics for them. Doppler broadening G2 of two is equal to one plus. Uh, e power of 
minus tau square delta square. Okay. Good. Now let's plot what we know about the G2 function. That is G2. That is two. So, okay. For coherent state, it is one. At the origin, and as, as I say, at the infinity as well. Also, you can do the mathematics for any cases, and you will get exactly one line, which is equal to one. That is for Poissonian distribution or coherent state. Good. So Henry, can you tell me what is the G2 function for thermal light at origin? It is two. It's, it's at two, yeah. Exactly. So it starts from here. So for thermal light, it starts from two. And we know that follows either of these two, either Doppler broadening or collision broadening. So either I will get a decay, which is exponentially like this, is faster because it has a factor of two at the front. Okay, so that is for collision broadening. Oh, it will be a, a Gaussian profile, which is a little bit sharper as well, because of the power of two coefficient. That is Doppler. Broadening, and the other one, the green is this. All right. So someone else, not Henry, someone else. Uh, da, 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 da. Valerio. Yeah. Can you tell me, Valerio, what is happening for the case of folk state when n is equal to one? G2 is equal to zero. Folk state of n equal to one, then at Origin is equal to zero. Zero. Beautiful. So at the origin, I will get zero. At infinity, it should tend to be equal to one, right? Because they are completely independent one. So I'm expecting to be like this. So that is for folk state. Folk state of n equal to one. Someone else, haha, let's go. It's getting a very crowded uh, image. Let's check it, if I can get something else. Uh, oh, okay, let's go with this color, okay. So, Felix, for n equal to folk state of n equal to two. So then it'll be a similar profile, but it'll only go half of the way down. Exactly. Towards here. zero. It starts yeah. from here, it goes like this. Lovely, thank you. So remember, again, we have three regions. One is here, which is below the Poisson distribution. We call it sub Poissonian distribution. The border is Poisson distribution, which is coherent state. And we have another region, which is, oh no, I have to go with a different color. Yes, this one, which is here, which is sub Poissonian region. Sorry, super Poissonian region. So this region is 
quantum. This region is classical. And covalent state is just at the border of the two. Clear? That's the meaning of G2. And remember that it, it is, it, I, I emphasize several times, this is not the field. This is the intensity correlation. This is what your detector clicks. This is the correlation between clicks of your detector, which gives you this. All right. So let me see what else I have to discuss for you guys. Um, I think before that also I can, I can describe something else. Let's look at um, an, an inequality because I, I think previously I discussed this plot when I look at the intensity fluctuation. If you look at the previous lectures, when we look at the delta n square, we got n plus delta i power of two. And I discussed the entire of the scenario based on the variation uh, or variance of intensity. And we say that the variance of intensity will dictate that you are in the quantum regime or you are in the classical regime. I didn't want to discuss about that. I mean, that was a, that was a, a classical uh, point, which is, I mean, this equation is essentially look like a, uh, uh, wave particle duality. This is what you get it from the classical mechanics, and this is what you get it from the quantum mechanics. So it's really uh, look like the wave particle duality for me. Okay. So now let's look at the uh, look at the G two function uh, again. G two of two, which we had it as normal order of intensity of two. A t times intensity of t plus two, normal order in the quantum regime, divided by intensity of t power of two. All right, do you remember this? Yep. Okay. So in the classical regime. You have the same quantity, but we don't care about the operators now. And that is the relation that we have. What I mean by intensity of T, intensity of T plus two averaging. Remember? This is what you would get as a signal, right? The same scenario happens for, for the time of two, essentially. What you do, you just, you take what we have it here and just you shift it. By the time of two. is intensity of T, this is intensity of T plus two. Assuming that you go to laboratory, how do you measure this? Felix, how do you do the averaging? Um, you can just have a long exposure, I suppose. So can I say that I want to do the calculation in an interval? What is your interval? Let's say 10 seconds? Sure. Yeah, okay. So the time that I consider is 10 seconds. Then I look at the, in 10 seconds I record the intensity. True? 
-hmm. Then you want to look at the intensity at T and intensity at T plus tau and doing the average. What you do, you displace the intensity by tau, which the tau is, let's say, two nanoseconds. And then you do the, uh, you, pro you look at the product of the two function and then you average them. So essentially, apart from the last part, last point and beginning point, which is the two parts that you need to have the two function to be set exactly at the same time, right? Yeah. And you know, at the end you will get some, uh, some extra region which you cannot do the autocorrelation. What you do, you divide the entire D space by T divided by, let's say, TI, which is what you are looking for. I mean, it's the, is the, uh, the, the time window, or you can look, uh, you can assume it that it's infinitely small, let's say, uh, variation in time. So that's this infinitely small variation in time. I, I don't write it in as a single function because that depends on, uh, uh, on the functionality of your intensity and you may choose different strategy to do the calculation, okay? So that is the TI. So essentially I divided the, these, let's say entire the function into N samples. Okay, so I have N sample. For each sample, I have TI, which I is equal to, let's say a, a quantity. And then I have TI plus two. I will do the summation of the product from one to N. This is what I have done. And then I have to do the average. So one divided by N, because those are the N samples that I do have. All right, is it clear? Essentially it looked like the integral that we do, but uh, <laughs> just, uh, just we expanded in the, in the standard form, let's say in the summation form. All right. It can prove that this, um, if we look at the, if we look at the, this quantity, this is smaller or equal to what is happening when you do, you don't have the delay. Okay. Because that quantity is positive. Okay, or it has the maximum value that you are expecting. You can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and prove this, but essentially it's not difficult to prove this, this uh, inequality. So what this, uh, what this does, uh, this means, this means that uh, that is look like I T I T, which is ex exactly the average of I T square, or that is average of I T square. Good. So G two of two is given by it, it plus two divided by it power of two. I have just shown to you guys that nominator is smaller than this quantity. So this is smaller or equal to it I T. What is this quantity? Eric? I will give you a hint. Look at this. What is the difference between the two? Um, the, the term, it's just that it's the value at zero. Bravo. This is nothing more than G2 of zero. 
So G2 of two, for remember, I use this, this uh, uh, inequality, which is valid for the case that I am familiar with, which is normal calculus, normal classical probability calculus. So for classical, for classical field or classical probability distribution, because that was the reason that we look, look at the relation between P, Q, W and, uh, and uh, wave function. For the classical field, I know very well that G2 of two is smaller than G2 of zero. This is what you see it from the curve. So if you have written, I will go up. This is what you get. For Doppler collision broadening, you will expect that G uh, at, the, at, the, at zero is maximized. Okay? This is what exactly what we will get from this relation. Good? Okay, let me surprise you with something else. I think I have written some explicit expression which might be interesting. So, Do you have questions, guys, or clear? No questions? Okay, good. So that ex this expression was y square divided by I square. Agreed? IT times IT, what we will get is IT square and dominator is I power of two. Good. What is the relation between delta I square what is the variance in delta i square? Is i square minus i power of two. Do you agree? This was the definition and we did the mathematics for. So then I will get, instead of delta i, uh, i power of two uh, average, I will get uh, i power of two plus delta i power of two divided by i power of two. Then from here, what I will get, I will get one plus delta i power of two divided by i power of two. So g2 of zero is one plus delta i power of two divided by I power of two. This is another way of watching the Poissonian, sub Poissonian, and uh, super Poissonian distribution. What I have done, I just look at the tau equal to zero, and what is the relation between the variance in intensity and look at the relation between the variance in intensity and intensity power, average of intensity power of two. I think it was three lectures ago. We categorize the field in three different ways. We say that if delta i power of two is greater than zero, we call it super Poissonian distribution. 
we look at the case when delta i power of two is equal to zero, we call that Poisson distribution. And we look at the case when delta i is below zero, we call it sub Poissonian. True? Again, we will get the same expression. So for super Poissonian, G2 of zero is greater than one. For that one, G2 of zero is equal to one. For that one, G2 of zero is below one. If the variance of intensity is below zero, this is the quantum regime that we discuss. True? Okay, so I will, I will get back to this point again from a different perspective and will tell you what I mean by a sub, sub Poissonian. This is not P, it's P. does not work. <laughs> okay. All right. Any question? Let's, let's look at the, the meaning of this. Uh, uh, if, if I remember well, you can, you can do uh, a little bit of mathematics and get, uh, get the case when G2 is below one. Okay. So let's look at the case when we have a G2 function, which is G2 of tau, which is essentially A dagger, A dagger, A, A. Mm. Let's look at the time equal to zero. Divided by A dagger, A power of two. Okay, I will define a quantity quantity which is given by a dagger, a dagger, a, a minus a dagger, a power of two. Okay. This is a normal order, right? I can write it in terms of any quasi probability distribution. So let's us write or express in terms of P representation, representation quasi probability distribution. Okay, so this quantity essentially will be equal to integral of D to alpha, P alpha, alpha, power of four minus, uh, okay, I can write it in this way, d2 alpha, p alpha, a dagger, a power of two. Remember, the integral of d2 alpha, p alpha is equal to one, okay? So this is what I have written here. I just multiply by one. Good. Then this quantity, if you write it down, you can even write it in terms of P alpha, alpha power of two minus A dagger A power of two. You can try just to expand it. Expand this and you will see that you will get the upper version. So let's do the expansion. 
So uh, alpha squared minus a dagger a power of two, that is alpha power of four minus alpha two alpha squared a dagger a my, uh, plus a dagger a power of two. Okay, so if you do, if you insert inside of the equation, integral of uh, d to alpha p alpha, this quantity, which is alpha power of two minus a dagger a power of two, that is equal to integral of d to alpha p alpha, alpha power of four minus mm, integral of d to alpha p alpha, uh, that quantity is two uh, alpha square a dagger a plus integral of d to alpha um, p alpha a dagger a power of two. So if you substitute this, this is the first term that we get it here. And if you do the mathematics, you will get that this term will be our a dagger a uh, with a coefficient of two, power of two, and that term will be plus a dagger a, power of two. So essentially that is two, then you will get the, uh, the upper expression, okay? So alpha square, this is a dagger a, nothing more than that. Okay, clear? So what I want to just show to you that you can write it in this expression. What is this quantity? Is it positive or negative? A dagger A is the average number photon, cannot be negative. Absolute value of alpha cannot be negative or imaginary. So this quantity here is a real quantity. True? Power of two is a positive quantity. Is a positive quantity. All right, so what we just look at this, we found that a dagger, a dagger, a, a minus a dagger, a, which is the quantity that we are looking for, it can be given in terms of quasi probability of P alpha times a positive Variable. All right. So for classical right, this is P alpha is a positive quantity for classical light or classical field. P alpha is positive. Then what we expect that a dagger, a dagger, a, a minus a dagger, a, uh, that's power of two, is positive. Are you following, guys? Are you following the discussion? If not, just let me know which part you are missing. I, I will explain it to you. Kate, clear? Okay, thank you. Randomly, I'm name, naming people. Okay, good. For quantum field, P alpha can be also negative, 
right? So what does it mean that this quantity a dagger a minus a dagger a power of two can be also negative? Good. Let's divide both part by a dagger a power of two, then I will get a dagger a dagger a divided by a dagger a power of two minus one greater than zero. And here a dagger a dagger a divided by a dagger a power of two minus one smaller than zero. What is this quantity? G2 of zero, the same here, G2 of zero. So then I will get G2 of zero greater than one for classical field, G2 of zero is smaller than one for quantum field. Good. But does, uh, does G2 have to be strictly less than one for a quantum field or can it also, can it still be, uh, is like the implication the other way? Like a G2 less than one implies that we do have a quantum field, but, but not necessarily the other direction. When you have a G2, which is below one is a quantum. Is, yeah, but is does, a proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, does it go the other way? Like no. if we have a quantum field, can we say that we for sure have G2 less than one? Uh, if we do have a quantum field, definitely is below one. Okay, okay. Or approaching to one maximum yeah, yeah. Is, is is the sub poissonian regime is here is the yellow region yeah okay so all quantum is yellow all classical is on gray and the current state is the border clear yeah. good uh, okay i actually have a question regarding that because i thought that for the quantum field your your a dagger a dagger oh oh uh, yeah. yeah, here, right? Uh, can you go back down? Down? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So for, for well, okay, so for a classical field, P and alpha is, is always greater than, is always uh, positive. But I thought that it was for a quantum field, P and alpha could be negative, but it's not always, right? Yeah, that's a reason that I have to place equal. Okay. Okay. I just considered one cases here, right? So uh, look at look at these relation. All right. So what I found for you is look at this condition, which is what is going on with G two of zero. All right. And previously we proved that for any sub Poissonian distribution, this is the case. If Delta I is below zero, then what I expect G2 of zero should be below one. Good. Excellent. So what, what, does this mean? I mean, we ha we have to we have to look at the situation. It's it's really really important concept. That's the reason that I'm emphasizing and I'm staying here for well, let's say I don't know uh, for uh, how long is we are discussing that maybe about one hour. W why why we care? 
why we care and we want to emphasize this. We, the, this first order coherency is fun, is, is clear. The second order co coherency is, is important in this sense that, look, I can look at the intensity correlation and what I get for classical light that is going for classical light or classical field, in terms of T, and my detector, they start to click, okay? From the first order correlation function, I can find out what is the coherence length. From the G1, I can find the coherence length. All right? So I, I think we, we, we discussed that. What is the coherence length? We, we assume that when uh, the visibility is still observed, so one divided by E was, was the condition that we had for the G. Now our detectors start to click and the click happens at any time, right? Completely random. Those are the clicks of detector. All right, and the coherence length assume that for this one, that's a coherent length, TC. So if you look at the G2 function, G2 function will tell you that if you take this interval and move around, you will see more clicks in T below TC. Because G2 of two is greater than one. So if I have, I'm in this interval, let's say the first one, I will move around and I will see this one. I will see three clicks here, right? I will move and I will get here, I will get four clicks here. I will get two clicks here. I will get no clicks here. I will get two clicks here. Okay, this is the way that you look at the correlation function. You look at the, uh, the intensity correlation. You look at the uh, IT and IT plus two. And now your toe is below the coherence length. Okay, and you do the correlation. So this is what we call it bunching. So what is happening? Photons for classical field, classical field, they come together. So either Four photons, they will stay together. Four photons, uh, sorry, here is three photons. Four photons stay together. Two photons stay together. One photon, one photon, two photons together, one photon together. So the photons, they will come out as a bunch, as, as a bosonic nature. Okay, so you that's true that is a thermal source that is true that is a Boltzmann distribution, is a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, then you expect the photons to follow the same statistics. So they will come out as a bosonic, uh, bosonic particles. And then they will bunch together and you will see four photons at the first pulse, three photons at the other one, and, and et cetera. But remember that tau c plays role. The tau c is a coherent length. If you go far away from that, then you don't see any correlation, okay? So we call these bunching, photon bunching, and that happens for classical field. I will come back to, the, to, to these at the end of this discussion. What is happening for, uh, for uh, coherent light? 
Good. Let's go for coherent light. Coherent light comes out as a train. Hmm. A very good regular trains of pulse. Which probability you are looking for? Two photons, three photons, ten photons, whatever. The probability distribution is going uh, is given by the uh, coherent light or coherent uh, state probability. Oh, sorry. Which, if you look at the, it, it's a Poissonian distribution. Is the mean photon, and the width also is given by the mean. So I'm expecting if you are looking for 10 photons, then those are the 10 photons that are coming together. And the same scenario. And etc. So for the coherent state, what is happening? You have a train of photons or photon, depending on what you are looking for, which they are equidistant. So it doesn't matter really where you are looking for the correlation between them. Always they are independent. Okay? So then you will get G2 of zero or tau is equal to one. And the last one is for the case of folks, uh, 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 what we call it anti-bunching. Anti-bunching of the quantum source. So then what is happening? If that's a coherent length of two, you don't get the correlation in neighbors that the correlation happens in later. So the number of photons that they are correlated are outside. So that is what is happening. The G2 of two is below one. In that specific interval, you don't have you don't have uh, too much correlation, and this is what we call it anti-bunching. So, uh, I think I um, should I stop here? Yes, I will stop here. So I will I will stop with the discussion. I remember when I was in high school. I tried to do uh, uh, um, young double slit experiment. At that time, we didn't have a laser. What we did had, we, we, we had a halogen lamp. And I remember that uh, what we learned in the high school was putting a filter, proper filter, you can in, in, induce coherency, okay? Which is true, you can do that. Assuming that you have a thermal light, what does it mean that you have a spectrum? Assuming that is bro uh, Gaussian broadening, okay? Or Doppler broadening. You have a frequency of omega naught. Then what you can do, you can put a filter at the front of this. Then you can make that to be sharp. You cut, you only pick up that region, you cut the rest. Good? So you, in, you induced the temporal coherency, temporal coherency. And for the spatial coherency, what I have to do? Because the beam is not coherent, it's coming from a, you know, a lamp.
this part of lamp has no correlation with this part of lamp. What I have to do to induce coherency in the special mode? Kale, any thoughts? Do you have to put a uh, slip before? Exactly. I have to put a pinhole here. I will force the entire delight passing through these. So then I will, uh, by passing through a pinhole, I will induce the spatial coherency, spatial coherency. Right? It doesn't come for free. You have to, exp you have to sacrifice many photons for both scenarios, for temporal and for spatial. And then you can put the double slit and you will see the fringes. Good. What I'm doing in those process, I will make it to be the same phase, right? I'm controlling phase with that. And with here, what I'm doing, I'm making monochromatic, which is that is a spatial phase, spatial variation. And here is a temporal one. All right. For example, if you want to do Michelson interferometry, you don't need even the pinhole. What you need, you need only the monochromator. I want to tell you, this will never replace a laser source. That's, that's the important point. That will never be a laser. Whatever you put, perfect spatial coherency, perfect temporal coherency, will never be a laser source. The laser source has a different photons statistic, okay? So the statistic that you do have for the, for the pulses that they are coming out, they are different. For a laser source, you do have the two above condition, but on the top of this, you know that the pulses the number of photons, they are equidistant in time. And they are distributed well in time, okay? And if you measure G2 function, always is one. While for the case of uh, thermal light, which after all of those spatial uh, uh, filtering and temporal filtering, what is happening, you do still the bunching. So the photons are coming out in random way, but they bunch together. Okay, so three photons are coming out here, one photon coming out, two photons coming out, four photons coming out, and one photon is coming out. Okay, and the distance between these are completely random. Is it clear? So we call these bunching. Photons, they stay together. Okay, with that, I will close the discussion, and we will come back with, uh, 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 with again, Humbry Brown and Twist, and uh, the quantum version, and homodyne detection. So, we can have a short uh, break now. So, uh, as, a, as a next step, what we will do, we look at the Humbry, Brown, and Twist experiment, but now in the quantum uh, 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 in the quantum language. So with a creation and inhalation operator. So uh, <clears throat> um, if you recall, the field that we get it from uh, 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 from the two detectors, they were given by E R and T. Let's say for. Uh, of course, the positive field, positive part of the frequency was E K, uh, A K. I'm writing from the previous note, by the way. E I K dot R. Mm, let's call it for I, essentially. So at the position of I, one of the detectors, I equal to one or two. Uh, that is I, and then you have 
a k prime e power of i k prime dot r i and we assume that there is a uh, there is a, a filter at the front of it so then the entire the, in the field is oscillating with the same frequency of omega t okay so this is uh, what you get it on the two detectors so one here which is r1 and one on the is k prime k k k prime and the second detector which is r2 okay and then of course you look at the uh, intensity correlation and time delay beautiful uh and in order to look at the intensity correlation, then you have to look at the G2 function. G2 function, I will write it just in terms of a, a non-normalized one. So G2 of uh, R1 and T1, R2 and T2, uh, I will write it in the, in, a, in the form that we know. It was um, E, uh, uh, that should be negative part, yes, E of R1 and T1, E minus of R2 and T2, then E plus of R2 and T2, E plus of R1 and T1, averaging. Good. So this was the G2 function, which we derived also from the previous, uh, uh, yes, maybe two lectures ago, or previous lecture. And then what we have to do, we have to replace the electric field here, which is uh, given by uh, the expression here. Replace it inside of these, and we know that they have the same frequency at the same time, then I don't care about e power of minus i omega t, they will cancel out from all four expression. So then uh, the g2 at r1 and t, and R2 and T, the same T, will be given by uh, EK, 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 EK star, EK star, then that will be EK power of four. And here also I assume that, uh, let's say, write it in this way. I assume that, uh, that both uh, K and K prime, they, ha they have the same amplitude. So that it will be EK power of four then I have a k negative part dagger e power of minus i k dot r uh, plus a dagger k prime e power of minus i k prime that is r1 dot r1 Uh, a dagger k e power of minus i k dot r2 plus a dagger k prime e power of minus i k prime dot r2 times a of k e power of plus i k dot r2 plus a k prime e power of i k dot r2. And then finally I have a k e power of i k dot r1 plus a k prime e power of i k dot r1. Averaging. Okay, so what I have done, I just substitute E minus R1, E minus R2, E plus R2, E plus R2, R1, inside of that equation, okay? So each one, they have two terms. Multiply all of them together, you will get two power of four terms, which is 16 terms. Right? Agreed? So do we have two multiplied by two, multiplied by two, multiplied by two. 
is 16 terms. Assuming, first of all, assuming that the two, let's say, um, sources, I mean K and K prime, are independent. That's the first condition that you do have. So it means that if you have something like n k, n I means a dagger k a k, n k prime, that can be written as n k n k prime. There is no other term. Assuming there is no other term, so I'm just looking at the that explicit expression. So that can be simplified into the following, let's say, uh, uh, two, 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 six steps. So then after simplification, you will get this expression, e k power of four, the average of a k uh, dagger, a k dagger, a k, a k, plus a dagger k prime, a dagger k prime, a k prime, a k, plus a dagger k, a dagger k prime, a k, a k prime. So by the way, this, I can swap these two together. The only reason that I keep it in this way is because I want to have it in the normal ordering. That's the only reason. K and K prime, they are independent. Okay, multiplied by one plus, you know that in the sum of those terms, you have, for example, you can look at uh, A, K, K, K prime. So look at this term, multiply by this term multiply by this term, multiply by this term. You will see that you have R2, R1, R2, R1. So then you expect something like that, e power of i, k minus k prime dot R1 minus R2, okay? And then I have another term, which is a dagger k prime, a dagger k, a k prime, a k. One plus e power of i, now is positive, k minus k prime. That r1 minus r2. So I, I don't do the calculation because it's given inside of your book. Okay. So that's the, the entire, these 16 terms will be simplified into that, those terms. All right. Then when you do averaging, remember that a dagger k, a k, that is the photon number that you get. So a dagger k, a k, that is the photon number in mode k, a dagger k prime, a k prime, that also is a photon number in mode of k prime. But I assume that for both of them, uh, uh, that is n, is the same, so uh, let's say the same intensity for both of them. So uh, doing the average over that and also simplifying the exponential. Yes, there is a question, guys. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in the second term of the, of the six terms, should, they, should the last one be unprimed or is, are they all primed? Uh, in which term? Uh, the second term. The first one, all the k's are unprimed and then the second one, only one is unprimed. Of three that are prime. That's okay. fine. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that looks more. 
No, that it's should be all list. prime. All of them, they are they no, are everyone. yeah, because that will give you exactly. if you if you pay attention that is look like n square. Since mm -hmm. we assume that all of them they are the same, that also is look like n square. Mm -hmm. Because we mm -hmm. assume that the mode of k and k prime, uh, they have the same intensity. So you are looking at the star, the two sides of the star. Okay. So mm -hmm. you, uh, you believe that the source, they have the same intensity. There is no distinguishability between the two. Let's say in terms of uh, having different intensity or different photo numbers. Yes, thank you. So if you do a little bit of mathematics and then simplifying the G2 function for R1 and T, R2, and t, then you will get uh, this expression. So you will get two e k power of four. Then you will get n square. This is what I said from the above expression. Minus n plus uh, n square. Okay. 1 plus cosine of k plus minus k prime dot r1 minus r prime. Oh, sorry, r2. Okay. There is one extra parenthesis here. Good. So that is the expression that we will get. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So, uh, by the way, uh, the detail of how, I, because today, as we discussed, I have to finish the lecture with homodyne detection. That's the reason that I'm not driving all of those details for a calculation that we have previously drive some of them, okay? So if you want to go from these to that, look at your book, one of those appendices. Uh, they have, uh, uh, in, um, in the book of Malin Scully and Sahel Zuberi, they look at the, the calculation, they expand the 16 terms and they describe how you can omit some of them, okay? Based on the statistic that you will get. So anyway, so this is the G2 function that we got. In, and remember, this G2 function, it is in terms of number statistic, okay? So you will get N square average minus N plus N average power of two times the cosine term. And you see that even in the quantum regime, this term exists. And this was the interference term. which by changing R1 with respect to R2, we were able, or if you expand the entire of this, you will get uh, in terms of R0, uh, lambda, I don't remember really all of those functionality, and also the distance between the two detectors, you can find out the relation, all right? So now let's assume to, let's assume two different sources, two different stars, let's call it. I will use the code in terms of stars, okay? When we talk about normal stars, I mean normal stars, I mean stars, well, what we mean, are they laser sources or they are thermal sources? Manuel? Thermal sources. They are thermal sources because they are different atoms that they are excited and then you will get radiation out of them. But in our calculation, we assume that we as a human will make a, a, a source which is coming also from, from a laser. So we make artificial star with, <laughs> with, with lasers. So if you assume the thermal source, 
Then for the thermal source, we look at the calculation and we find what is n squared. We have to look for n square value. For a thermal source, what is n square? Let's ask Arman. Do you remember Arman? It is given by 2n squared plus n, right? I don't expect you to memorize these thing, sort of things, but we just drive this, OK? So if we look for the thermal source, we will get n squared, which is uh, uh, average of intensity, which is given by 2n squared plus n. And substituting inside of g2 function, what we will get, we get the g2 function of r1 and t, r2 and t, which is equal to uh, 2 epsilon k power of 4. Then the n goes away. Then we have 2 here. So that will be 2n power of 2 plus n squared, which is 3, essentially. So let me write it down. 3n squared plus n squared uh, uh, cosine of k minus k prime dot r1 minus r2. Good. So that should be 2 e k power of 4 n squared factor. Then we will have 3 plus 1, uh, 3 plus cosine of k minus k prime dot r minus r1 minus r2. Good. Remember, this is for the thermal source. Uh, what we have it for, for a star. Good. If we assume that we do have a laser source. A laser source, which is, I mean, uh, you put, uh, uh, let me get my thoughts straight. So uh, assuming that you have a plastic at the front of your laser source, and then you shine your laser source on the plastic, then you will get some speckle pattern. But we know that still the statistic is given by the Poissonian distribution, OK? Then I can look at the two different side of the laser source, or let's say the speckle pattern, and look at the, the correlation between the two, OK? Intensity correlation, of course. And if you do that for laser source, we know that for laser source, n squared is equal to n squared plus n. This is the Poissonian distribution. True? The values of n, right, it's looked like that. The delta n is given by square root of n. So this is exactly that expression. So uh, then replacing here, we get g2 of uh, r1 and t, r2 and t equal to uh, 2e k power of 4 and um, uh, ba, 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 ba. I don't know why I get three. Yes, I got three. Yes, that's true. Okay, so I get n power of 2 and goes away and power of 2 is remain and square remain. It will be 2n square plus n square cosine of k minus k prime dot r1 minus r2. All right. And then simplifying this further, we get 2 e k power 4 n square. Then uh, that would be 2 plus cosine of k minus k prime dot r1 minus r2. Good.
So <clears throat> let's plot it. Mm, I am plotting G2 divided by 2 e k power of 4 n square. <laughs> Essentially, what I'm doing, I'm plotting this expression and that expression. In terms of delta k dot r1 minus r2, in terms of this argument, Right? So essentially what I'm doing, I'm plotting two, uh, sorry. I'm plotting these two functions, two plus cosine of X and three plus cosine of X. One that is for thermal and the other one which is for coherent source. Okay, so if you plot this, Definitely the value, the maximum value will be, I mean, you have to shift the cosine by uh, on the vertical axis by three, or you shift it by two. So essentially either you will get, let's say, because I want to have it in the same scale, uh, two, three, and four. So all of them, they start from, uh, uh, for the thermal light, it starts from one, it will be four. Then if that is, let's say pi divided by two, that is pi, and that is minus pi divided by two, and that is pi and minus pi. And that one is three pi divided by two, minus three pi divided by two. Then for the thermal source, what I get at a cosine of pi divided by two will be zero. It will be equal to, uh, to three, and then at a pi, it will be equal to two. So it will be something like this, oscillating. And for a coherent light will be something similar, but in the lower case. In the lower. Hmm. Did I plot it properly? Okay, you got what I mean. Okay, that's what you have it. So for both cases, essentially you have the sensitivity. Okay, and uh, uh, someone can can someone look pl uh, please look at the previous lecture and tell me uh, what was the value for delta k dot r one minus r two. I, I drive this expression. Uh, delta K was uh, K phi, uh, gosh, that should be something like that. Pi R zero divided by lambda phi. Can someone look at the previous notes, please? Maybe I do have it by myself, but let's make this here these notes. Do I have? Yeah, I think you have it right there. The pi r naught over lambda phi. Is the pi r naught divided by lambda times phi? Uh, that's what I have written down. Okay, that it should be fine. I think uh, I in. <laughs> I tried to find an intuition uh, just to, to get that expression. I think that should be correct, very likely. Anyway, so, so when you look at the uh, uh, U delay, right? I mean, you, you change uh, the distance until you will get uh, that quantity to be minimized. When it gets minimized, then you know what is this value that should be equal to pi and then you will get uh, the phi, which is given by lambda divided by r naught. And you resolve the problem. And r naught is the distance between the two detectors, by the way. Right? Or should I call it d? Is, is what 
people they were looking for. Good, and there is no atmospheric uh, terms, which is uh, those terms that they were sensitive to atmospheric. So it's a uh, highly oscillating function of k plus k prime. Good. Any question? No, beautiful. Uh, other approach that people they look at it, which I think I think was Glober. Um, I, as you know, of course, the Glober also got Nobel Prize for his contribution to quantum mechanics. So the other way that you can look at it and is a toy model. And in this toy model, what he assumed, he assumed that you have two atoms on the two sides of a uh, star. Okay. So you have atom number one, atom number two, and both of them, they are excited. Okay, so it means that if you look at the, uh, uh, the internal uh, state, you will see ground state and excited state. If you look at the excited state and ground state, both of them, they are excited. Then they will emit photon. What you do in your laboratory, you have two detectors that you detect them. Detector number one and detector number two. And then you look at the current of them. This is what happens as a, as a toy model, if you want to look at the star and see how Humbry Brown and Twist work. So essentially, uh, if we look at the wave function of, of let's say, the, this system, you have one photon coming from the mode K and one photon coming from the mode K prime. But now look at the physics. I don't want to do the mathematics. I just want to tell you what is the physical meaning of uh, 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 Humbry brown trees if you look at two individual atoms. So how detectors can see the two photons. I mean, we look at the cases when only the two detectors they click. Okay, we don't we don't care about the cases when only one detector clicks. So we only look at the cases when the two detectors they will click. All right, this is the the correlation that we look for. So let's look at uh, look at this case, Felix. Can you tell me? I'm looking at the condition when both detectors click. And I know that I have only two photons in the system, one coming from atom number one, one coming from the atom number two. Can you tell me what are the possibilities that the two detectors, they will click? Um. For the photons, because the, it means that this is a closed system, essentially, as I say. So when yeah. they click, it means that detectors, they will see one photon, each yeah. of them. Yeah. How many possibilities do we have? So they could both come from uh, the first source or both from the second source? Yeah, so um, let's write it this or, way. Yeah. Atom number one, right? Atom yeah. number two, and that is the detector number one, detector number two, okay. And that's another possibility, which I will write it down here. Number one, number two. Sorry, Flix, I, I stopped you. No I want to just write it down uh, this scenario. Okay, that is one and detector number two. Okay, so now tell me, please. So you could have a photon from one to one okay. and two to two. Okay. Or one to two and two to one. Exactly. These are the conditions that you have. So essentially, when the two detectors, they will click at the same time, or let's say uh, they see photons, one of these two cases will happen. So essentially the wave function of atom, or let's say the two photons with detectors will be these two wave function together. And when you look at the probability, then you have to look at the square modulus of these. And 
you will see that the correlation appears in the calculation. Do that as an exercise at home. Why I'm giving to you as an exercise, because this is done in many books. <laughs> okay, you can, if you have problems, you can look at different books and just see the case. So this is another way that Glover uh, uh, pictured and, and he wrote the, the proper description. Even if you have two thermal sources, photon number one, photon number two, or atom one, and atom two, still you will get the correlation, okay? Please do that as an exercise. Lovely. So now I hope that you have a clear picture about the G1, G2 function, and even you can expand it to GN function. I mean, you can look at a correlation between even T currents. Okay, or four of them, or between two autocorrelator, uh, two, two coincidences. So all of those things, you can look at them. And this is what happens in the laboratory. I, I, most of you, I think very likely they, you will go to laboratory, a quantum optics laboratory. This is what we look for, four-fold coincidences, two-fold coincidences, three-fold coincidences, all of them, they are given in these formalism. All right, so now, uh, we should appreciate that photon detection was a great, great discovery. Without the photon detection, we could not do any of those sort of experiments, which is what happens. Photons will be absorbed by, let's say, atoms, if you want to call it, and then one electron will be emitted, or let's say will be going to the photocurrent, and then either you, uh, you avalanche this process and you will get a signal, or you can have a superconducting nanowire detectors, which you can look for that one, which is based on the heat, and you uh, create a local heat due to a single photon, and you can detect even one photon or two photons or three photons. But what we should appreciate is that with the photon uh, detection and looking at the statistic, of those detection, we could find if a source is classical or is quantum or is coherent. And that is amazing. If you think about that, just having detectors and looking at different sources, you can understand if those sources are, are quantum sources or classical sources or etc. Now, the only things that we didn't discuss about how to detect is squeeze state. We did not mention anything about the squeeze state. And uh, if we look at the previous uh, uh, lectures, one, it was about the beam splitter in efficient detectors, which we simulated with the, with the beam splitter. Even there, we say that what is the probability of detecting M photons from N photon? We did all of those calculations, which is about the photon states and, uh, and the folk states. And also we did a calculation what is happening uh, for coherent state, what is happening for thermal state. And we found that all of them, they will be, except the Fox state, all of them, they will be scaled by eta, which is the efficiency of your detector. But we didn't talk about the squeeze state. I, I gave you as an exercise, what is happening with the squeeze state if you send it to a beam splitter. Now, today, we will tackle this problem. How to detect a squeeze state or how to measure the quadrature. Because if we know the quadrature, we know where we are doing the squeezing, right? Good, so let's do that. Any question? Is clear the problem that we want to tackle? We call this homodyne detection. And there are different versions of it. Let's go with the, the standard procedure. I will, I will skip a few of those calculations, but I will leave the rest for you. Because, and I will, I will try to do the rest uh, if, you can, if you can follow the, the time. Okay, so in a homodyne detection, you have an unknown 
quantum source or quantum light, which is very likely is squeezed, okay? And you want to characterize this, or people, they call it tomography, okay? I don't want to really proper mentioning that in a, in, in a tomographic way because I have never described a class, let's say discrete quantity uh, or discrete uh, variable quantum state tomography. These continuous variable. And then uh, you have an unknown source, but in the laboratory, what you do have, you have a known light source. which in most of the laboratory non light source means that we do have a coherent state, coherent state, which the frequency is well defined and everything is known. All right, so, uh, and you, what you do, you mix these two together on a beam splitter. I told you that you should appreciate the beam splitter. Sorry, Felix, I muted you. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> That's okay, I keep forgetting. Okay, you mix it on a beam splitter. So you have an input port, which is A and B. Uh, sorry, you have two input ports, which is A and B, and you do have two output ports, which is C and D, okay? Beam splitter action, which links input to the output, by the way, I'm, I'm writing in the inverse already, I'm writing in the inverse way, is given by T I R I R T. So what, that, what do I mean? This is, I think we previously drive all of those equations. So this means that A is given by uh, T C, sorry, English. C is given by T A plus I R B, and D is given by uh, that is T by the way. D is given by I minus uh, sorry I R. Uh, A and then plus T B. Good. And of course, we know, of course, the conjugate creation operator will be uh, C dagger is T, which is T, by the way, remember the T and R, they are real quantity here. For balance beam splitter is one divided by uh, 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 one divided by square root of two. And that is A dagger plus, uh, sorry, minus I R B dagger. And D dagger is equal to minus I R B dagger plus T B dagger. All right, excellent. Good. <clears throat> so the laser source this is coming from the laser I will send it through a trombone with the trombone I will control the relative phase between unknown beam and the laser beam that I have. So this is essentially is, uh, uh, is made of four mirrors, which you can move these two mirrors together. You can make a delay line here, or essentially you control the phase, I would say. Good. So your laser is given by a coherent beam, right? But I remember, and, but I want to recall that here, after these trombone, I can control the face as well. Good.
Clear? Lovely. You can put a detector here and a detector here. Very fast detector. They should be fast detectors, by the way. And then uh, depending on the type of experiment, you can look at the correlation between the two, depending on the type. On the type of the experiment. Not necessarily always you need to look at the correlation between the two, but I mean, this is something that, uh, uh, that, uh, that depends on, on the experiment. So I have a detector in the part C and I have a detector in the part uh, D as well. All right. Good. Now let's see what we will get after the beam splitter the beam splitter. We have two ports of C and D. And detector in C and detector in D, they will see intensities. All right? So detector C, let's look at the detector C. What it sees? Tenglu, can you tell me what is the, I mean, this is the action of the beam speeder and you have photons and etc. But essentially what detector C will detect for us? Tenglu, sorry, you are muted. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking, sorry. Um... No worries. So does it see the C or does it see the intensity? Does it see the field or does it see the intensity? You just see the intensity, yeah? Pardon? It, it just... You should just see the intensity, right? Intensity. What is intensity essentially? It's like it's like a field, like it is C dagger C, right? Yeah. Which you have to do averaging because that's the job of a detector. Good. Excellent. Thank you. So now let's do the the mathematics. So first of all, I have to do C dagger C, and this is the current that you will get it from the detector. All right, let's look at the C dagger C. So C dagger is given by T A dagger minus I R B dagger times C, which is uh, T A plus I R B. Good. Multiply it together, then you will get T square A dagger A uh, pa, 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 plus R square B dagger B. Pay attention to which one goes first, which one goes last, okay? Because those are the operators. Uh, plus I R mm, A dagger B minus B dagger A. Good. Josh, is there any, any mistake or is? Should there be a T? There will be a, a T, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Please check it out if there is any mistake, let me know. All right, beautiful. Remember that we know that T squared plus R squared is equal to one. 
right? Because we believe that the beam, our beam splitter is unitary. So essentially T plus R is equal to one. And that Fresnel coefficient, the transmittivity and reflectivity, if you sum them up together, you will get one. All right, and I will come back to this. I mean, we will discuss that in, in detail because that's one of the conditions that you have to do for homodyne detection. So let's look at the C dagger C, which essentially this is nothing more than number of photons in C detector. Okay, then that is given by T A dagger A plus R B dagger B plus R T A dagger B e power of i pi divided by two plus b dagger a e power of minus i pi divided by two. I took I took the the i inside of the expression and just I wrote it in terms of exponential of i pi divided by two. So, haha, now let me ask, who wants to be, okay, Eric, you're smiling. Let me ask Eric. So Eric, can you tell me what is B dagger B, assuming that we have a, a laser? Um, it's just the average number of photons. So in this case, uh, the beta, uh, the, the absolute value square of beta. Absolutely. So there is no phase relation, you will get beta squared. This is what you get it as average number of photons on a coherent state, right? So since you started to answer, so can you tell me what no. is, yeah, <laughs> what about <laughs> this one? Um. You're doing average on the coherent state. I know what is B on the coherent state, right? Uh, oh, okay, so you just replace it with the uh, with the, the the coherent parameter of beta that guy. Exactly. And what about this one? Um, that's, yeah, the complex conjugate of that guy. Beautiful. This is what you will get. So essentially, averaging happens, or we will do the average over the coherent state, the very strong coherent state. So this means that NC will be equal to T A dagger A plus R beta square plus R T beta. Then what I have, I have an average of A dagger e power of i phi plus pi divided by two plus a e power of i phi plus pi divided by two with the negative sign average. Good, any question? And uh, just making sure you can take the, the, the beta out because it's like the uh, the unknown states of wave uh, wave function is or like unknown states. Uh, they are so independent. Cat is in like tensor product with the known uh, one. So when you do the average, right? You do it over a state, right? Mm -hmm. Quantum state. So one of them is beta. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the. This unknown. one is okay. unknown uh, quantum state of psi, the other one. Right? So that is on the port yes, of yes, A, yes. that is on the port of, uh, of B. Okay? B operator mm -hmm. only acts on this, not on this one. 
Okay, uh, makes sense. Thanks. Okay, good, clear, fantastic. All right. Uh -huh. This, of course, is the average photon number on a non port, or let's say, uh, average uh, photon number of a non quantum state. But this term is interesting. Manuel, you are smiling. It seems that you catch what is this state. This one. A dagger, e power of i, phi plus pi divided by two, plus a, e power of i, phi plus pi divided by two is a negative sign. What is this state? Oh, this operator, what is this operator? Let me help you. It looks like squeezing. Um, no, you are. I mean, you're not far away, but can you tell me in terms of quadratures? Right, you have to express it in terms of quadrature. Do you remember that we had x1 and x2? Yeah, what was x1? Um, x1 is ah, okay, right? Yeah. And what was x2? Um, the same, but with the sign and an i. And 2i. I think it was something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that the definition that we had it in? in... OK. I don't remember if it's the definition, but it's the, it's the one that I know. OK, lovely. So this is the x1 and x2. Now let's do this expansion and see what we will get. Okay, so this is a dagger. That will be cosine and sine. So it will be cosine of phi plus pi divided by two plus i a dagger sine of phi plus pi divided by two, then plus a cosine of phi plus pi divided by two minus i a dagger this is sorry, A. Sine of phi plus pi divided by two. Do you agree? Good. So this will be A dagger plus A divided by two, two cosine of, oh, let's say, I can take away two, cosine of phi plus pi divided by two. And the other one, it will be plus a dagger minus a with a negative sign divided by two i sine of phi minus plus pi divided by two. All right. Good, Manuel? Yep. Okay, what is this? Manuel? Uh, this is a displaced state, basically. Is... Yeah. No, 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 D don't go fast. So what right. is this, this one. one? X1. X1, lovely. Cosine of phi plus pi divided by two. And what about the other one? Uh, will be x2. x2 sine of phi plus pi divided by 2. So what is this, the entire of that? Do you remember that we had x1 and x2? This seems that I am rotating to phi plus pi divided by 2. Right? So this is the x one of phi plus pi divided by two. And then the other one will be the other relation. 
Okay. Oh, sorry, it will be in the negative direction, by the way. This is the passive rotation, what they call it. So that will be x1 of phi plus pi divided by 2. And that is the x2. So this angle is phi plus pi divided by 2. Because the other term, the projection on this will be negative, and this one will be positive one. Do I do do I draw uh, correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is nothing more than x one at phi plus pi divided by two. Is this vector? Is a new coordinate that I have. Good. And of course, there is a coefficient of two. Don't forget that. So then NC is given by T A dagger A, which is the average on a non state, plus R beta squared plus two beta RT times the average of X1 phi plus pi divided by two. Huh. It seems that the intensity somehow will give me the average of quadrature. True? So intensity, intensity on intensity of detector C provides average of quadrature. True. So I can find the average of quadrature. How can I find the entire of those states? So I have a state which is, you know, it's given by the probability distribution, whatever, and that is given by x1 and x2 is given in this space, which is the quadrature space or q and x or whatever you want to call it. So how do you reconstruct the state? Arman, do you have any thoughts? So I have a, a distribution here, which gives me a probability, right? And from those probability, I can find the average of quadrature. And by the way, we will come back to the, uh, to the error that we do have it in the quadrature. We will discuss about that. But just having a feeling, how from the intensity from that setup that we just discussed that with this setup of formal detection, how can we reconstruct the state? How we can find different components of it? Do, do you look at different phases? Exactly. If I change phi to be equal to minus pi divided by two, then I'm measuring along this line, right? If I have phi equal to zero, I will measure along this. That is phi equal to zero. Uh, sorry, zero. And that is phi equal to pi divided by two. Phi equal to uh, pi divided by minus pi divided by four. I'm looking here. So by continuous variation of phi, I will. Uh, it, I think it should be negative direction. Uh, by continuous variation of phi, I will be able to reconstruct what is the x one of phi plus pi divided by two here. Yeah. Thank you, Arman. Excellent. Exactly. By changing the, the, the trombone, changing the phi in the trombone, I will be able to find the average of x1. But remember, in order to do so, I'm always having a problem with this term. And I have to resolve this. And uh, uh, 
we can do we can we can do this sort of calculation and moreover essentially what i am looking for in the laboratory i look for delta n c squared which is the variance in uh, in intensity you can record the intensity but also you can record the variance in the intensity the variance is important which is given by n c squared minus n c squared which what we found it right so i only look at the n c here but you can do the calculation and find n c squared which is the square modulus of what we have it here and then you can look at the n c squared which is you can do the mathematics from uh, from c dagger c c dagger c and doing the mathematics for that case okay do it as an exercise for yourself it's not extremely difficult it's just a straightforward calculation however when you do all of those calculations you will get mass equation but we assume two things first beam splitter the beam splitter that we do have has a little bit of reflectivity which means that most of the light will be transmitted okay so it means that t is much greater than r that's the first condition but our laser is so powerful that even beta square r which r is small but multiplied by beta square which is the amplitude of the laser is much greater than t a dagger a the reflectivity of the wind speed is small but so our laser is so powerful that always we can neglect the first term here and if you do this sort of calculation what we will get for delta n c square we will get 1 minus t square beta square plus 4 beta square t 1 minus t and then i will get the variance because now i am not dealing with average of x but i am dealing with the variance of x delta x1 of phi plus pi divided by two power of two so from the variance of intensity remember i'm looking only and at one port which is port of c and looking only at that port and looking at the variance which is intensity power of in, intensity power of two minus uh, an average minus intensity average power of two then you will get this expression which contains va contains variance of the quadrature I get the variance of quadrature. And uh, uh, by changing phi, you can get, you can get the projection on the quadrature, quadrature space. clear so this term 
it is interference of what we call a local oscillator laser, which is the laser that we have it, and the unknown state. Look, phi is coming from the laser, but x1 is, is the, uh, the variance that you will get it from a known quantum state. You do, that, you do the averaging there. And this term is coming from local oscillator. It's coming directly from the beta square. We call these shot noise. Okay. In the experiment, what you do essentially, you have phase that you change with trombone. Then you look at the, the variation of delta and C square. Okay. And you do have a shot noise, as we discussed, as I just mentioned. Then you will get a variation of the signals. And suddenly, this, the signal, the variation of delta in C squared goes below the shot noise and then goes up. This is what you get it from this expression. By varying phi, you will get in some places when you have squeezing delta x1 phi plus pi divided by 2 power of 2 for if it is squeezed then that is below 1 divided by 4 right for the rest of the cases is for the, for example for coherent state is 1 4 for, but for this case you will get below 1 divided by 4 then what is happening for that argument for that specific state for example if you squeeze like this then along this direction, you, what you will get, you will get, you will get below the shot noise. Okay, when you go below, below the shot noise, then you understand that you do have a squeezing here. Clear? Beautiful. There is other version of it. Uh, by the way, here. Actually, sorry, sorry yeah. I have a question. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, why would it be below the shot noise when the this interference term seems to be always positive? The inter look. Uh, so what, what what is the value of? Uh, uh, God, I have to write it in in a different form. Uh, let me remember, but let me take that one. So beta squared, if I have to take the beta squared power of two, let me see if I can write that out. So you have to play with equation just to, in order to see that. So one mm -hmm. minus T beta squared, uh, one minus T uh, plus four T and delta X one. Okay, that is the constant one. And okay, so uh, so if delta x one is one divided by four, then that term will be equal to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm yeah. sorry, my bad. The definition of shut noise for me is one minus t beta square. Oh, uh, okay. Not that term. Sorry, it's. You, the power should be equal to one. So that is the shot noise. Clear? Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh -huh. I, uh, since I was rushing up, I didn't pay attention to the, uh, to, uh, to the power of two here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the shot noise is one minus T beta square 
which what you get it if delta x one okay. is equal to one divided mm. by four of course i mean the power of two is what we are talking then uh, if you factor out the, the calculation you will get one minus t a beta square one minus b uh, one minus t beta square and that is the shot noise that you do have and whenever uh, delta x1 power of 2 is below 1, then this quantity is below 1, then you go below the shot noise. Okay, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Okay, lovely. So just to, for the rest, if, if you catch that, that's excellent. If not, that's the expression. 1 plus uh, 1 minus t for t delta x1 power of 2. Okay. So if delta x1 power of 2 is below 1 divided by 4, then this expression 1 minus t plus 4t delta x1 power of 2 is below 1 minus t plus t, which is below, uh, which is below 1. OK? When the squeezing happen. Good. So I, I briefly mention another case, which is very important. It, it will take about five minutes. My apologies. I know that I'm, I'm running out of the time, but that will be the last subject. So uh, there is another technique that they call it, uh, oh, uh, before doing this, in in the experiment, I assume that the frequency of unknown state is omega and the frequency of my laser is omega. Okay? So unknown state or the state that I want to do the tomography or measuring the, sque the squeezing parameter and the local oscillator, they have the same frequencies. Okay? They have the same frequency. If they have different frequency, one is omega, the other one is omega prime, they call this technique heterodyne detection. Okay? So just get familiar. By the way, these are all coming from classical uh, electrodynamics. It's not coming from really quantum mechanics. People had homodyne and heterodyne detection. They were known in the community uh, for many years. They have application in quantum optics, which we can measure the quadrature. But remember that there is a term of heterodyne, which the local oscillator and the unknown states, they have different frequencies. Okay? So final things to discuss is another technique, which for this technique, you need both the textures to click. Okay? You need to record the intensity of both detectors. So, this technique is, is known as balance homodyne detection. How that works? So the same physics, nothing really changes. So phi will be controlled here and then you have unknown state here. Then you have C, you have D, and both detectors, they will click. But now you look at the uh, difference between the two of net correlation. You subtract the two detector, okay? They call it balanced homodyne detection. And the beam splitter, is 50-50. So essentially, C is given by one divided by square root of two of uh, uh, A minus O plus I B, and D is given by one divided by square root of two of I A plus B, okay? That's for 50-50 beam splitter. Then what you look for is NC, 
which is C dagger C. And also, since both detectors, they will click, then you have to look for ND as well, which is D dagger D. Good. So I can quickly write that. So it will be one divided by two C dagger C. Then I think that should be, uh, I, I didn't write that in books. No, I have not written. But it should be a dagger a. No, sorry. A dagger a plus b dagger b plus I think I a dagger b minus b dagger a, and that will be one divided by two a dagger a plus b dagger b. Um, minus I A dagger B minus B dagger A. Okay, I think it should be something like that. And now you look at the uh, look at the case when you have N D C or N C D, which is the difference between the two. I call this the average of N, C, D, the difference between the two detectors, the two intensities. Then quickly you will get, uh, you will get, uh, if I remember, I think I have done that calculation somewhere. Uh, you will get um, I, I, A dagger B, minus B dagger A. All right. Then again, you can look at the NC power of two. You can look at the NCD uh, power of two. Then you can look at the variance of NCD power of two. If you look at the variance, the variance for a laser, which is given by beta and uh, here, and after that, you will get beta e power of i5. Then for this laser, approximately, that will be given by beta square delta x1 pi plus pi divided by 2 power of 2. For a powerful laser, that will be the result. So, uh, and here is much easier. What you look, you subtract the two, uh, the two currents and you look at the variance of them and directly that is proportional to uh, delta x1 power of two, proportional to the variance of the quadrature. There is no shot noise there as well. So the good point here with respect to the previous one is that there is no shot noise, there is no, one minus t power, uh, times beta power of two. Directly, you can measure the quadrature. Okay. All right. So, uh, and uh, uh, there are details which I did not mention. How do you measure the shot noise? You have to block the uh, the signal. When you block the signal, then you will get the shot noise. And you know how uh, you know uh, what is happening in your experiment. So those details are when you go to the laboratory, you will learn it. Uh, uh, when you when you build up the electronics, when you build up the setup. So for uh, with these, I think uh, you do have all knowledge to follow up with any experiment, any quantum optics experiment in laboratory. So uh, next lecture will be spontaneous parametric down conversion, which is just a specific, specific should I call it nonlinear? Yes, uh, yes, yeah, somehow it's nonlinear process. The, the, the process is linear. It means that it doesn't go with the power of the laser. Uh, um, uh, 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 square modulus of that. Uh, 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 but the process is inverse of second harmony generation. So you will see uh, how to create entangled photons in the laboratory. 
So uh, that will be the discussion of next lecture and some of the property of entangled photons there. And the following one will be on uh, application of uh, um, quantum states like, uh, BB, like uh, qu in quantum cryptography. Uh, for uh, I think most of you, you have taken the course of quantum science and technology, right? How many people they have taken or they have not taken, let's say? How many people they have not taken the course? Uh, Felix is one. So oh, I, uh, I've taken it. You have taken. Oh, Flo, you have not taken this. So uh, there, uh, and also Nazani, there I had one lecture of three hours about what is classical, what is quantum, right? About which, let's say, st statistic in terms of Bell inequality, hidden variables, uh, will be considered as a quantum statistic and which one can be considered as a classical one. So if you guys need that, I will send a link to that video. Or if uh, some of you, I think uh, Felix has taken Arman as well, Eric, uh, most of you, Josh. So you can you can share your link. It. Pardon? I haven't taken it. Oh, you have not taken. So uh, if someone has a link, can you kindly distribute it among us? Because, uh, uh, oh, I can share the note with you. I started really with the playing with the coins and say to you what is really new about quantum entanglement. That will be needed to close the entire, let's say, uh, quantum optics and quantum information in terms of basics that you should know. So I will stop the video and uh, I wish you a great week. And then definitely we'll see each other next week on Tuesday.